All right, reference layers tutorial part two, the longer one. So you've made your reference layer, you're sure the lighthouse is next to it, and you're sure you're on another layer that can reference the reference layer. And yet when you color, you notice that your colors look like this. They're, they're not respecting the lines at all, and you end up with this blob. Anybody that's ever colored a comic book for the first time knows about this look. So the most likely culprit is that the setting you need to change is buried under the tools property palette here. I'll show you. I'm going to move myself and cover this, this blob. It's uh, right here. The wrench icon and the tools property palette. And then all the way at the bottom, you see anti overflow. That's what you want. And then here, the top option is do not cross lines of reference layer. That's the most important one. While you're in here, if I were you, I would also click the eyeball next to do not cross lines of reference layer because uh, that makes this option show up on your tools property palette. That's really handy. And then click fill up to vector path two. I'll talk about that later. It's it's super handy, it's a killer feature. And I also use area scaling. I'll talk about that later, but that'll be up to you. The most important one is do not cross lines of reference layer. So now I need to go back there so you can see that now we should be able to color quickly and efficiently without any lines crossing over. And so far, it seems to be working out pretty well. If you color with uh, flat colors, this is super fast, super efficient, and I love it. So that's the most likely thing that you need to change. It's in the tools property palette. You'll need to do it tool, tool by tool. I don't know how to apply this to every tool, but honestly, I want it on every tool. It works on every tool. It works on all the brushes, the fill tool, the uh, special effects. It, it works on almost everything up here. It's amazing. So good luck. And now let's try to figure out some of the other reasons why it might not be working or why it might not be working just right for you. Welcome to my 100 pixel by 100 pixel. Welcome to my 100 pixel by 100 pixel canvas. Uh, we're going to use this to show you exactly how the reference layer works when uh, when your color layer bumps up against it. And if you are using a reference layer and it's working, but you're not liking how the color interacts with the lines, uh, this tutorial is for you. That's what we're going to talk about. So say you have a reference layer and you have a few. Nice, beautiful lines there. And then you start coloring and uh, everything looks like it's going okay. Color, color, color. Maybe some down here too. All this looks fine, right? But because we're at 100 pixels, this is going to be pretty easy to see. What if we zoom in on some of these pixels where the line interacts with uh, color? And what if we take away the paper color? and leave that transparent background. Do you see that there's pixels, there's semi-transparent pixels in the line that the color did not go into? It's even easier to see if we make the paper some sort of bold, ridiculous color, like that bright pink, or maybe, a, let's try a real lime green. And now we see that our two colors leave out those pixels. So the reason for this is that I have anti-aliasing turned on on this uh, on the G pin that I'm using. And that's only for demonstration purposes, because I never use anti-aliasing. I turn it off always on all pins and brushes. And the reason is these semi-transparent pixels that anti-aliasing generates just cause so many problems when it comes time to do something like this. This problem with anti-aliasing and coloring can be addressed with uh, the, the tolerance setting over here. I've enabled it in the sub tools palette options. I, I had to go here and then click the, uh, the eyeball. And now I have tolerance here, but honestly, I don't even use it much. If you turn the tolerance up, you'll see that it will dive into the line more. 
uh, but you'll be in situations where you have to tweak that value to, to get it just right. And honestly, it's easier to just turn anti-aliasing off, period. Uh, an anti-aliased black line will look like this at low resolutions. So it's it's obviously more jaggedy and won't have that smooth appearance. But honestly, if you're drawing at a resolution so low that anti-aliasing makes a difference, quit it. Quadruple your resolution, and then you'll get lines that actually appear smooth because you're drawing at you know, 4,000, 6,000 pixels. So anti-aliasing causes problems with uh, the the reference layer border detection situation. So vector layers versus raster layers. If you've scanned some line work and brought it into Clip Studio to color it, what you're working with is raster layers. If you've opened Clip Studio and just started drawing on uh, you know, the layer that they give you, that's a raster layer. If you haven't specifically created a vector layer, then you're working in raster. If you're working in raster, then you're going to have to deal with uh, the tolerance setting of your anti-overflow, and also uh, you lose out on a lot of flexibility. Real quick, the difference between raster and vector is largely in how your computer understands uh, your work. So here I've just drawn a line on a raster layer. You and I both see a line, but your computer sees a collection of black pixels arranged in a specific locations uh, on a grid. But with a, with a vector layer, say you draw a line, and now what your computer actually sees is a line. There's a start point, an ending point up there somewhere, a lot of curve data built into these nodes, some width information, and uh, color information. It's a lot. Your computer understands that you've made a line, and that means it's easier for your computer to, uh, let me show you. I'm gonna make both these lines reference layers. I'm gonna make a new layer for color. And let's see, I'll just fill that in there, that in there, that in there. Now, if I want to, say, move this vector line a little bit, I can. And then it becomes easier for me to uh, alter the colors to compensate for that. If I want to do that same effect to uh, this uh, raster line here, I, I totally can't. It's not even possible. Also, what I've just colored has met the borders of the black raster line. So if I get rid of the raster line, I'm left with a hole that I need to recolor. With the vector line, uh, my colors have met at the border of not the black line that the vector line generated, but the vector line itself. You understand? In Clip Studio, the vector line is always one pixel wide, no matter what size canvas you're drawing on. So I'm still left with a hole, which I don't love, but there is a way to fix that. Let me re-enable that vector line, go to uh, area scaling in my, you know what, let me do it the long way. The sub tools, detail palette, anti overflow, and then area scaling. That's on, it's set to one pixel, and I have it set to a rectangular scaling. And that means that whatever I draw is going to go over by one pixel, which in this case means if I draw here and here, I'm going to overdraw that vector pixel. And now I have two colors that match perfectly up. They mesh, they bump up against each other in a perfect way. You can do something similar with a raster line. If I want my colors to proceed underneath that line, I can, I can go to uh, area scaling and increase it to uh, like five or six and probably get a pretty good effect. Almost. Obviously, my colors are uh, being drawn underneath the line, but I've, I've overshot my area scaling. Oops. So it's, it's also doable with raster lines to have perfect color uh, uh, 
well, no holes left behind in your coloring, but it's more difficult than it is to do with the vector lines. So let's look at some of the ways I use the, uh, the reference layer. Uh, so I have this awesome cartoon here of a couple packing up and moving, and it looks like they've accidentally packed up their son and he's in a box somewhere. So uh, I colored this, but I took the color out to show you that because these are vector reference lines, it just becomes really easy to quickly color right to the lines. And the style I ended up using for this uh, uses a lot of white space. So this is what it looks like finished. And I was able to color this in, I don't know, 10 or 20 minutes because these tools make it so easy, especially to do these simple flat colors. Like the lines are identified as lines, so it's easy and fast. So I have this style that I've been enjoying recently where I use the pencil tool instead of the uh, some kind of ink tool. So if you look closely at one of these lines, you can see that, and this is only possible with the vector tool, you can see that my coloring goes to the exact center of each line where the, uh, where the vector line is. So if you're using a vector layer, you can use the pencil tool and get just some really clean, nice coloring that's visible underneath the line, but only halfway there. So it reads really cleanly to the eye. Here's another use case. This is how it works in a fast uh, caricature. If we use vector, then we can use the vector eraser, which is of course really fun. But then if we use the uh, vector layer along with the reference layer, we can actually end up coloring much faster than we would be able to otherwise. You can see I make a pretty heavy use of the, uh, the vector eraser. I love it. The way I have draw to vector line enabled, it's kind of important actually that I do overdraw all my lines and then erase the tips like, like you see me doing here. Uh, so I have a script to quickly isolate the head and fill it with white. So I just select outside the head. And then what the script does is it creates a new layer underneath my reference layer and it locks the, uh, it locks the colors, it locks the transparent pixels so that I can't draw outside of the white area. So with that combined with these strong lines all being connected and being, uh, vector, I'm able to really go pretty quickly through this in a way that you know, I've, I've seen plenty of fast artists, but I'm always trying to be faster myself. And I've been uh, really enjoying this technique recently. But you get the idea of reference layer with vector stuff. It's just really powerful. Okay, one more example. Say you want to do a painting, so you're not going to see any visible pen or pencil lines per se, but lines are still going to be useful to help you guide your paint. Uh, well, that's what I did here. I needed to draw this corn on the cob pretty quickly, so I took this photo, and then I uh, drew lines over... Uh, where I wanted most of the paint to go. Uh, you can see that there. Then I filled it in flat. And then I, I'm not sure what this black stuff is down here. I think that happened that maybe the files corrupted or something. It didn't stop me when I was painting the corn cob. Uh, so I filled it in flat. And then using these lines as guides, I was quickly able to do some painting. And then uh, where I really, really used the lines was it was going to be slow going to put shadows on each corn kernel, but with the reference lines, I was able to just put little blobs in on each that stopped right at the, uh, the kernel underneath it. And then highlights on top of that, 
looks like I didn't follow the lines as much for that. And what that left me with was a decent, fast, painterly corn on the cob. Don't critique it too much. It's not supposed to be this big. It's an icon. You're supposed to be seeing it like it's supposed to be an inch big on your phone screen maximum. And as long as it reads as corn from that distance, then I'm happy. So corn, which normally could have taken a long time to illustrate each little kernel and the shadow and the highlight on it, actually pretty fast. Thanks to reference layers. <laughs>